Yeah, my name is Wali Akimpelu. I'm from GHUAPL. Um, uh, the coach here is uh, Ivan Sheska from uh, Rogers University uh, in, um, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, our keynote speaker is uh, Misha Doha, um, who's going to talk to us about now is perfect time to talk 6G. Let me say a few words about our guest, our uh, keynote speaker. Uh, Misha Doha is now Chief Architect in Ericsson, Inc. in Silicon Valley, US. He was professor in wireless communications at King's College London, driving cross-disciplinary research and innovation in technology, sciences, and arts. He's a fellow of IEEE, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Society of Arts, the Institution of Engineering and Technology, and a distinguished member of Harvard Square Leaders Excellence. He's a serial entrepreneur with five companies, composer and pianist with five albums in Spotify and iTunes, and fluent in several languages. He sits on the Spectrum Advisory Board of Ofcom and acts as the policy advisor on issues related to digital skills and education. He has had ample coverage by national and international press and media. He's featured on Amazon Prime. He's a frequent keynote panel and, and tutorial speaker and has received numerous awards he has pioneered several research fields, contributed to numerous wireless broadband, IoT and M2M, and cyber security standards. Holds a dozen patents, organized and chaired numerous conferences, was the editor-in-chief of two journals, has more than 300 high, highly cited publications, and authored several books. He is a top 1% cited scientist across all science fields globally. It's my pleasure to welcome Nisha Doha. All right, it's perfect time to talk 6G. I thought I'll do the uh, talk today in three stages. First, I'll, I'll talk you through the um, questions which typically an investor would ask me uh, to my companies. There are actually five specific questions they always ask, so we're going to try to answer those. And then we're going to look at use cases, and then we're going to move on to some challenges. And uh, because we're in the 6G era, I'll propose six challenges today. Of course, there are many more, uh, but I thought that's a good, a good starting point for today. So let's look at these uh, really important five uh, technology trends we have observed over the last decades as we started building telecom systems. And they, they answer actually the, uh, uh, the, uh, the investor questions, right? So the first one is a growth trend. We're very familiar with that. And that answers the question, what's actually happening? And interestingly, over the past uh, decades, as we went from 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, et cetera, uh, we've always seen that amplification of certain KPIs, whether it's data rate or latency, uh, by a factor 10, right? So logarithmically, something always increases, right? So Henning said uh, in his opening keynote, we don't actually need this in, uh, in 6G. And guess what? The people in the 5G era have said the very same thing, and the people in the 4G era have also said the very same thing. It's a bit like Moore's law. There's very little we can do about it. It just happens, right? So whether that is a tech push or an application poll, uh, truth is it just increased really over time. So therefore, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't get hung up too much about what type of killer application is going to be driving 6G. We just have to accept, you know, this is going to happen. I know what 6G will be able to do. I know that. I don't know why, and I don't know how to do it yet, but we know how it will look like. And then by virtue of extrapolation, we also know what actually 7G will do, or 8G if we go on like that, right? So let's remember that. Second trend, that's the why, and that's the trend of consolidation. Uh, you know, that trend has been articulated in very different forms, uh, but really roughly, what happens is we introduce a great idea with the odd generation, and then uh, we always need the even generations to consolidate that, right? So uh, we introduced voice, then uh, the internet, and now a more immersive ecosystem. And um, and actually, really, really timely, Hans Vestberg, a while back, he's now the chief exec of uh, Verizon here in the United States, used to be the chief executive of Ericsson. Uh, he said, look, guys, we started designing 3G when the internet wasn't around. We just started designing 4G when the iPhone wasn't, wasn't around, right? And we did start designing 5G when the XR devices, which will be coming over the next 12 to 24 months, have not been around. And equally, uh, we will de start designing 6G uh, before device XYZ. I don't know what that device will be come around, right? So therefore, you know, let's not get, hu get hung up all too much about this, but let's remember the trend of consolidation. There is an interesting trend around atomization, right? So I call that the uh, trend of atomization. That's how things really pan out. And there's a, uh, a law called Cooper's law, Martin Cooper, allegedly the first person to make a mobile phone call. You know, he, he kind of figured out, you know, capacity 
uh, until very recently has uh, multiplied by a factor of a million over all these years. And uh, we did a bit of a zoom down and try to understand what really contributed to this capacity. It turns out physical A is a factor five, then you got spectrum factor 25, and then you got smaller cells, a, a whooping factor 1,600, right? So if you, if you start to understand, you see really that smaller cells and larger spectrum is really the, the largest ingredient to our capacity increase over the last, uh, you know, the last 30, 40 years, uh, and a physical layer which supports that, right? So clearly, wider bandwidth, smaller cells would not work with a proper physical layer because we'd be able to do what we're doing today. Uh, but it also shows something, you know, something which Henning said, and we heard uh, from previous keynotes is, it's not only about the physical air, there's a system thinking we need to go about. And uh, often in academia, we find, uh, I'm not sure, sure about really that happened. I was a professor until recently. Uh, maybe it's a skills thing, but the majority of focus when it comes to G, the G's generation, 4G, 5G, 6G, has always been on physical air. And uh, you can look at this, factor five, right? So we need to start system thinking, really start, uh, you know, think wider than just the five. Then we got the, uh, who's going to really contribute to this? So uh, only 5G, 6G here, huh? we do have tech enablers. I won't talk all, about all of them, but uh, quite a few of them, hardware actually, is quite a big topic in the industry. Uh, you know, we're looking at neuromorphic devices right now. We just pumped uh, $10 million into MIT uh, to, to help us with neuromorphic design. Right? So to, to figure out, is that a compute uh, fabric of the future, which allows us to do stuff at zero energy cost? And that's really what neuromorphic can do, uh, because the operations of addition is naturally weaved in into, into the constructor. So therefore, the energy consumed is close to zero. Now, that, this is really interesting if you get down uh, energies to zero or, or, or close to zero. A quantum is a big construct, and I think we will have quite a few quantum uh, talks later on. So really interested to see how this feeds in and a lot of other things uh, on the hardware and the material side. Now, um, then we do have, um, right, um, not sure what's happening here. Uh, then, of course, we do have open source. Now, there's a, a lot of uh, open source is quite exciting and big companies do use open source quite a lot uh, so, uh, to, to, to the surprise possibly of the ecosystem. Um, but the uh, problem is always with open source around the trustability of the code, the security. So uh, there's a recently a Lock4j incidents, if you have actually uh, followed that, it's a huge security vulnerability which came out of the open source uh, libraries and uh, hybrid events are really challenging. So uh, the other day I was in Stanford, we really struggled, but we're doing good so far. Um, so open source Linux Foundation, for instance, or Oran is a big initiative as well, um, which uh, Ericsson together with Nokia actually are the largest contributors, which also seems a little bit counterintuitive, but we really believe uh, we need to get this right. And then of course, making sure we weave an AI into the infrastructure to make that happen. We had clarification, acceleration of processes over time. Another one, and that's the, uh, the, the big one, right? How much? And uh, the CTIA has released recently a really interesting study about the economic growth of uh, 5G. Um, and they based that on numbers of 4G. And since we know that things work by trend, you just interpolate that and you figure out what's going to be the value of 6G uh, over the years to come. Now, I'll put a question mark there because we can't really put the values there right now. Uh, but the red boxes tell you every single month we delay rollout, there is a significant uh, economic penalty. Uh, we quantified that in the 4G area. Um, CTIA did a, a projection on how this would look like in the 5G era. Uh, by virtue of uh, interpolation, you multiply that 12 billion by six and you get your 6G value. Uh, and therefore, it's really important we get uh, everything right in terms of technology, regulation, spectrum, et cetera, to roll out 6G. So let's not uh, delay that. Let's make sure we get this out. So these are the five trends. Now, based on these trends, let's have a look a little bit on the use cases and the standards roadmaps, right? So to really get this right, I just want to show you a little bit on what's happening here. So right now, um, you know, we've been doing basic research, fundamental research already for quite a few years uh, out of Finland, we have heard all around the world, a lot of things enablers have been researched when it came to uh, the 6G capital abilities. Then big ecosystems started moving. So, you know, in the United States, we have something called uh, the Rings program, uh, which Ericsson also contributed substantial money to that. This is really looking at uh, developing next generation capabilities here in the United States with the top universities. Uh, Europe had their HexAX project. We do have also the Next G Alliance doing things and etc. So all around the world, stuff is happening. ITU is kicking in. And let me zoom in a little bit on uh, some of these constituents. So let's start with the use cases. We did publish just recently an updated version of our 6G use cases. We had one from two years ago. Um, that's an updated one. 
And um, it really centers around, you know, f f let's say three, four themes, right? So first theme is all about humans. This is really make sure we get that comms capability, fully immersive Internet of Census Society going by 2028, 20, 2029, 2030. Uh, it's also about machines injecting intelligence into the machines natively. It's about reprogramming the world. So we believe there's going to be a future for digital twinning and or uh, about actuators, et cetera, to start influencing our environment. And the fourth one is really to make that sustainable. Now, what do we need to make this happen? Well, we got some technology families and that will resonate, you know, with all the subsequent uh, talks you will hear today. So clearly it's about connectivity. We call this limitless connectivity because we really wanna make sure that you get every single place on earth covered with good capacity, low latency. So huge challenges there from network design, um, you know, from spectrum in physical layer. It's about trust, making sure security is built in, but trust is natively built in, privacy is built in. It's about intelligence, uh, and it's about a completely new compute fabric, right? So if you think about it, you know, we have now, and Henning has alluded to this interestingly, you know, we've completely flattened networks, compute, and storage. Today, you don't really care where things are being done anymore, right? So we have um, uh, my Dropbox. I just downloaded the slides from Dropbox. I don't know where the stuff is. It went through my mobile, uh, and therefore, literally, storage has been uh, has been uh, flattened to me. No, ma no matter, I don't know where it is in the world. Same with compute. We now uh, doing a lot of edge compute stuff in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, I've done just a recent one with uh, Warner Bros and um, uh, Dreamscape and Qualcomm and NVIDIA. Uh, it's public, you can look it up. So we're completely flattening the network compute uh, infrastructure. It's really interesting party. Now, let's, let's have a look as an example here. So we did something at the Mobile World Congress. Uh, we called it holotaring. And it was a surprise hit. Nobody expected this, actually, but it has really uh, given a lot of resonance. So you see here a holographic comms. So there's a person here having a sensor, a 3D real-time volumetric sensor, and she's talking to her friend who has the uh, holotiring glasses on and sees an AR environment with a high fidelity and with a uh, really great spatial anchoring capabilities that other person, right? So we believe this is this could be the first prototype really towards 6G showing this holographic society. And um, the magic here is the really the fidelity of the picture, really high quality stuff. So how do you do this over networks today? How do you configure slices? How do you get this really going? And the other, the other thing is also about the spatial anchoring. So we don't talk much about this in the telecoms community, but companies like Niantic, who are behind uh, um, Pokemon Go, spend a good time of their of their their day and try to figure out how do I spatially anchor the content. So if I move around, you guys don't move uh, from table to table, right? So you actually keep sitting there as holotiles, uh, uh, as right? So really, really interesting. We got a lot of press out of this, a lot of interest from every single big Silicon Valley company you can imagine. They wanted to know how we did it. Um, and of course, we told them, but under heavy NDA. So this is um, Ericsson. Now let's go to the uh, artist one. So artist is, um, uh, how, how do I best describe it? Uh, can I say the Etsy of the United States? Uh, uh, it's really a standards organization here in Alliance, which looks uh, really after the United States. They have spent a good deal of trying to figure out, you know, what are good use cases? And I'm specifically mentioning artists, and uh, uh, you will see on the next slide, I'll mention NGMN, because actually these are the only two alliances or uh, industry bodies which have reached an industry consensus from vendors and operators and application providers from all around the world. Um, all the other 6G white papers have always been very individual contributions, just as I have now presented the Ericsson's uh, view on 6G. Uh, but you can download that from other companies um, and other alliances, but they're always quite narrow. The really broad ones are ATIS, just have a look at it. They structured that around robotics, uh, sensing individual uh, user experiences, distributed sensing comps, etc. So really interesting paper, really looking also on trying to differentiate what's the difference between 5G and 6G, right? How do we really make a difference there? So this is not just saying well, it would be good to have this and that, but really deep diving into saying, hey, you know, we could do this with 5G, but we can't do that with 5G, so we need 6G to appear. So therefore, uh, worthwhile read, we did contribute significantly. So did we contribute to the N NGMN 6G um, use cases. 
uh, very interesting initiative as well. I did contribute uh, when I was early on at King still a, a, a paper worth reading because it also has gone to great depth trying to understand what's the difference between 5G and 6G. We do, we, in the 5G era, we did this. Uh, you know, I, I was very rigorous with that at King's College London because often people would come to me and say, hey, let's do this uh, use case. And it uh, turns out we could actually do it with 4G. So we need, really need to be able to draw the line and say, this, uh, this can be done with 5G and this cannot be done with 5G. So we need 6G. We're reading these papers. Uh, please do if you haven't. Now, once the uh, use cases have consolidated, uh, this goes now to the ITU. They will crunch it, build the KPIs, and what will come out will probably look like this. I'd be surprised if it's massively different, right? And why do I know that? Well, because in telecoms, we have that Moore's law, uh, you know, that law of growth. So therefore, whether you like these numbers or you don't like these numbers, whether you agree with them, or you don't agree, whether you think there's an application, there won't be an application, these numbers will look like that, roughly. Okay, so we'll have 10x uh, average user experience, latency, user plane latency of 100 microsec. I'm not sure why we need it, but uh, you know, I'm not questioning these numbers right now. There's one number though I'd like you to pay attention to, and that's the, uh, the, uh, the data volume density, right? So it's currently a two-dimensional density, so meaning how much data is being generated per square kilometer. It's a gigantic number, right? So it's really, really big. I couldn't come up with anything um, which could absorb or generate that type of density. Unless, of course, we start involving machines. So we start having machines autonomously swapping data around in huge, uh, huge quantities. And or if we go three-dimensional, right? Think drone, think uh, flying taxis. A lot of stuff's being currently pioneered in, in, in the San Francisco, in the Bay Area. Uh, suddenly, if your two, 2D uh, data density becomes a three-dimensional construct, then these data rates make sense. So maybe one of the killer apps for 6G will really be that volumetric data provisioning in 3D space. So if I pay attention to this number, 10 petabits per second per square kilometer is really big. Now, once the KPIs have been frozen, anybody can go out and build a 6G system. Okay, anybody. IEEE has tried that with WiMAX in the 4G era, WiMAX 2 to be precise. Um, in the end, 3GB prevailed. So, you know, my bet is the game will be thought out in 3GBP. So let's focus on that. 3GBP, we've seen a mentioning of a few releases here. Now, the, re the releases until release 19 are 5G releases. They have nothing to do with 6G. It's 5G advanced, actually, to be precise. Okay, so these are 5G releases, and you can go to the 3GB website. It's all open. You click on, you can download all the specs, by the way. This is not a closed circle per se, so you can download that, get it. And currently, if you click on the release 19 study items, I just brought out this box here. Super interesting. They're talking about metaverse, right? So bring this back to Charles, uh, Charles' keynote we had earlier. And a lot of the SLAM capabilities, spatial anchoring, volumetric transmission of data. So a, really a lot of interest study items being thrown out by industry at the moment. And then from release 20 on board, we'll see 6G releases coming out and they will take another 10 years to be uh, fired out, churned out, being, and then we can start building, right? So we estimate about by 2025, the very first type of uh, 6G release uh, to come out, right? And this is when we really start engineering then uh, the system. So, and the, the projected numbers are my personal numbers. So there's no 3GBP, there's no Ericsson uh, number, but simply by virtue of extrapolation, because I know how it played out in 5G, how it played out in 4G. This, this is a fairly good guess, I think, how things will play out in 6G. Now, how do we see that, right? So um, if you look at, from an Aries's point of view, you know, if you look at 5G, we got this famous triangle. And um, a friend of mine, you know, I showed this to a friend of mine, he said, uh, Misha, you're a terrible community. You always use these acronyms, right? So, and they look like passwords. Now, I agree with him. Like, so every every time we put like EMBB, uh, it doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? So they look like uh, heavily encrypted passwords. Anyway, so EMBB, uh, it's about broadband. Uh, URLC is the very liable low, low latency comms, and MMTC is the massive machine type communication, so IAG, right? So in 5G advanced over the next releases until release 19, we will broaden that with new capabilities. It goes, you know, no, the, the triangle becomes larger. And um, then we move into the 6G area, we expand it. So we keep that triangle, the top and the, 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 the corners are left there, but we introduce these new capabilities, the red ones, which is all about immersion. So we're starting to, to build uh, you know, immersive experiences, um, spatial anchoring, uh, volumetric constructs, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore that type of fully immersive society is emerging in 6G with all its capabilities. 
So having now talked us through the, um, um, you know, the, the roadmap and how this plays out, let's look at the challenges, right? So let's have a look. So again, you know, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll have taken six challenges. The uh, truth is there are probably another, you know, 94 of those. Any of you can come up with loads of challenges. I keep that at fairly high level, a very system level. I hope I inspire the audience, uh, which is a mix between academia and industry, as well as the online audience. Um, I know there's a lot of academics on there. I've seen uh, loads of friendly faces, uh, friends there. Um, so really take this as an input and a challenge to come up with things. We did publish, I just call for on 26G, early 26G papers, uh, which are much more in depth in terms of uh, technical details, uh, even down to hardware, CMOS level, what needs to be done from a sampling point of view, uh, all the range up to applications, new IP protocols. So I will not talk about this today. Uh, you can read these papers yourself. There's a lot of other stuff which has come out, but I feel these two papers are as timely as they were two years ago. So challenge number one is really enable this cyber physical continuum, right? So um, we see the world really evolving into something which will have this physical construct and this digital construct, and it was very separate before and is now starting to merge. Now, that requires, of course, a lot of sensing, which we talk about a lot in our 5G, 6G community, but it also requires a lot of actuation. Okay, and we don't talk too much about this actually, so this downlink hasn't been explored too much. And in fact, that closed loop has not been explored at all. Uh, simply from a control loop point of view, you know, we're doing sensing, we act on the sensing, we reconfigure something, right? So how will this play out? So currently, the cellular has not been designed to have a low loop, a low loop kind of, uh, um, a low latency control loop. Uh, how do we control it, all that? So we have no notion really how this will play out. We need uh, a lot of, uh, simulation tools. We need a lot of fundamental tools. Uh, those who are on control theory, how would uh, Yapunov's uh, stability criteria play out in a world where suddenly I can reconfigure macroscopically my environment, which influences how I perceive, uh, you know, reception uh, experiences, etc. So therefore, we really need to work on this a little bit more and really start thinking from a system point of view, rather than just, you know, this is a file layer capability, or this is an uplink uh, um, improvement in terms of latency, or this is a downlink improvement, right? It has to come as a system in package. How would this work together uh, in, in, a, in a joint package? The second thing is, I think is it, it, this is a big homework, right? So, and that is the transition from what I call this 5G local area network to a 6G true internet, okay? Because one of the big value adds of uh, 5G was the low latency. And it makes a huge difference. I experienced it personally. Uh, I did the world's first 5G uh, piano concert from London to Berlin. I was playing in Berlin. My daughter was singing in London. And I felt that power of immediacy. You haven't felt it yet. That's why you don't appreciate low latency. But the moment, you know, this will hit consumer products, you will know what I talk about. Okay, so therefore the low latency is a huge value add. And we talk about the low latency in terms of manufacturing halls, right? So if industry talks about low latency, it's, you know, instrument your manufacturing halls, you do have these control loops and all that. This is local area network if you think about it, like 1990, whatever, six, you remember the days when we were nailing the ethernet cable uh, to the walls of our dorms? This is what it is. And uh, if we want this very, very attractive feature of low latency to be a global global construct, we need to start thinking internet. So how do you do this? Well, we don't know really. We really don't know. So if you look at the latency contribution uh, from an end-to-end -end link, as an example from Los Angeles to London, uh, you will see we do have an application delay. Right, so there's my Zoom encoder. Right now, Zoom is doing the, the encoding and decoding of the signal, which takes exactly 76 milliseconds. Okay, 76 milliseconds. This goes then over a network, um, likely fiber, it could be 5G. And then after this, we also have the constituent of the speed of light. So uh, the red boxes are a bit annoying, I have to say, because you can't fundamentally change them. But we can do a bit of magic on the green and the yellow box. And we as a community, the telco community, we did our magic with the yellow boxes. Over the last years, we ensured as long as your uh, signal goes over 5G, we can provide end-to-end -end slicing, which gives you essentially a highway through the infrastructure, from the radio bearer configuration, to the PDU configuration, to the slice configuration, uh, to the edge routers, and if you're lucky, you go straight into the next operator, you have an end-to-end -end link, which virtually, if you subtract 
The speed of light has zero latency, okay? That's what we did. And in fact, you know, stats are being released right now. If you play a game on 5G, your latency is much better than going over Wi-Fi or, or in fiber. The reason is because we designed a slicing capability natively into the network. Wi-Fi and, uh, uh, and, and fiber doesn't have that by construct, how that's been constructed. You know, I'm not critical of Wi-Fi. We need Wi-Fi. It's a great complementary technology. Uh, but if it comes to critical things like this, currently 5G has the edge. And uh, so we have done that. The question is, in 6G, could it be something better, something uh, something we can maybe API in as a developer? So if I'm developing a game in Unreal Engine, I can actually make use of that slicing architecture and really make sure I, I go in from there. Can Will there be a new IP protocol, right? A new IP? We are, we've tried for 20 years to come up with a new IP protocol. Maybe something new uh, may pop up. So I just give examples. Uh, but we also need low latency codecs. It doesn't make sense that we as a community invested billions of dollars to get a one millisecond, 10 millisecond network if Zoom comes along and takes 7,600 milliseconds. So we need that. We need standardized codecs, low latency, and ideally volumetric because the future is 3D. So therefore, there's work to be done. I have co-founded an IEEE working group a few years back on standardized haptic codecs, where we also look at latency. Um, so therefore, we need that as well. And this is happening. And maybe we need also a bit of standardized AI uh, to help with the predictions to beat the speed of light. So it's all open. We don't know how to do that currently. I know that the gaming industry uses that. If you're playing Fortnite or a game against somebody on the other side of the world, like Chilin, who was uh, on the other side of the world, okay? So if you play with her that game, a lot of uh, predictive analytics is happening to give you that feeling of immediacy that you're really engaging. Can we do the same thing in 5G? And once we have that, Voila, we've gone from a 5G local area network to a 6G internet. That's really where we want to be. So think internet. Uh, third one is, I would, have, I would like to, you know, I'm saying there's also sitting on the advisory board of Ofcom, which is the UK regulator. Um, we really need to make sure we don't, we avoid the spectrum trap. You know, we have been, uh, it's, I, I like to liken this to the string theory in physics. So physics received the string theory, got a lot of money in physics. Uh, NSF was dishing out lots of money to string theory. Maybe so we're telling, I'm saying this here, these laboratories. And, uh, and actually string theory hasn't truly advanced any of our knowledge of the universe, right? So just think about how much money uh, you know, how many theories have probably been killed as a side result simply because the large bulk of money has gone to string theory. So let's not do this in 5G, 6G. So we have, we have invested quite a lot of millimeter wave in terms of uh, research and, and devices and all that. It's not giving us the returns today as we would hope, okay? And uh, let's not do that same thing in the terahertz. Terahertz is a great band. Let's explore, let's do things, uh, uh, but the value the, the grand value of cellular is in the mid-bands, full stop. You can argue with me as much as you want over coffee break, the values in the mid-bands. The mid-bands are expanding. You see that we think now it's gonna be from 7 to 20 gig. Uh, so my message is very simple. If you come up with a very attractive 6G technology, whether that is joint sensing and comms, whether that is intelligent reflective surfaces, whether that is a cell-free massive MIMO, ultra-massive MIMO, make it work for, this, for the mid-bands and you are on the road of success, okay? So if you can make it work there, it will, it will be a real thing. So therefore we think, you know, the, 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 the gravity of research should be in there, the gravity of development and standardization should be there. And of course, you know, go out and sub terahertz, do things there, but let's see, that will probably be very, very specific. In terms of uh, cognitive networks, they have been evolving. I've been, I've been in there when I worked in France Telecom. Uh, ever since release eight, we fired out that notion of self-organizing networks. Uh, a few of you will remember those days. You know, this has evolved now. So we've gone from something which was uh, kind of autonomous, uh, automated networks to self-organizing networks. What's the next big thing, right? And I've been arguing that we can now start thinking really uh, from a synth self-synthesizing point of view. So networks what des that design themselves. Okay, and that's really a parting break. And in fact, in the coding community, this is happening today. The reason Microsoft acquired uh, GitHub for billions of dollars is for Microsoft to learn how do GitHub programmers think? How do they program? They've built an AI around this. And today, uh, that AI is so powerful that it writes code with you and for you. And almost 50%, uh, almost still like 40 something percent of, the, of all the code recommitted back onto GitHub is actually written by an AI engine today, 
okay? It's not a human written code. So the self-synthesize in the, in the coding community is happening. It should happen in our community. There are implications for standards. There are implications for APR. There's implications on how we do interoperability, et cetera. Uh, but this move will come eventually, and I think is an interesting one to go through. Another one is on zero energy carbon neutral. So we're very keen on getting zero energy devices and carbon neutral networks. So how do you make that work? Really from, a, from a, you know, even from a device point of view, can I run my iPhone without recharging it ever? Can I run my IoT devices uh, without recharging them ever? Just using ambient energy, and there's a lot of that. And how do we make this work? How do we make this work with an architecture um, so that this is a, a viable proposition? Okay, so I'll leave, uh, leave you that. Just last but not least, uh, privacy has always been a very big headache. We have not solved it within 4G, 5G. It's been solved at the T's and C's, the terms of and conditions. If you want to use Google Maps or uh, Facebook or Meta on your iPhone, you accept the terms of conditions. You hope the company is good enough to stick to them, and often, more often than not, it doesn't happen. Can we solve it from an engineering point of view? the same way as we have solved uh, cryptography and security. So I'll leave you with these six challenges and I'm looking forward to some questions and of course discussions in the uh, over coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have a few questions from online. Uh, first question, do you think the 5G is unneeded evolution at mobile communications? and it was possible to go from 4G to 6G. I think that 5G has not taken uh, time to grow up. So 5G, 5G is needed, please don't say that. 5G is probably the biggest revolution in our uh, you know, G family. Uh, there's so much innovative stuff which is happening on the interface from the radio point of view, and above all from a software and cloudification point of view. We cannot skip 5G. So uh, 6G will not happen without 5G. Uh, is holographic interaction given? In the holographic interaction, given we are looking at zero trust scenario, how do we protect users? For example, an uninvited third party joins the meeting. Are we looking at new encryption methods? Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So there are two things. One is the uh, privacy question, the other is the cryptographic question. Uh, privacy question is actually very, uh, is a very urgent question because just imagine me going fully holographic with some holographic glasses and uh, suddenly I'm capturing a lot of uh, faces here. And you, maybe you don't want to be in my, in my talk. Today is good because everybody knows you're here. But imagine I'm walking in the street somewhere and I'm capturing you. How do you really make sure that with that new augmented reality construct, uh, with the metaverse emerging, uh, we are not really violating a lot of privacy? We don't have really a solution for that. We have ideas on how to do it. When I say we, it's not necessarily Ericsson, but the community has ideas how to solve that, to, 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 how, to, how to deal with that. Um, but I think it also needs to be regulated to some, some extent to make sure we get that right. On the security side, there's a lot of stuff, and I think we're going to have some court talks later on, so I will skip the, the answer to that. But I think, you know, get, to get at least on the asymmetric keys uh, beyond quantum, uh, you know, to make them quantum resistant using lattice codes. I worked on that quite a lot, so, uh, but I'll leave it for my, my speakers later on in the day to answer that question. Okay, one final question. I think you touched it a little bit, but I think maybe you can say more. What changes are needed in the network layer to support 6G requirements? Um, all right, so this is a huge question, I have to say. So how, how can I, so first of all, you know, as I said, think 6G not only in the interface uh, construct, think of it as an architecture construct. So, um, and as you know, those who know how 5G works, we have something called a PDCP layer, where for instance, we do the breakout for the distributed uh, MIMO, the comp operations in 5G today. You know, can we natively build this in uh, at a different layer? So we don't have introduced a specific PDCP layer within for GPP. Can we make this native an IP construct? Um, can we think of uh, new ways of handling congestion? Today we have L4S and ECN marking. Could this somehow be done more natively as part of my networking construct? So there are loads of things, there are loads of research challenges, and maybe you can just email me or LinkedIn me, and uh, I'll give you a long list there. So, but let's stop here. Yeah. All right. Thanks.